name is Andy Cahan. I'm director of author events. And I'm very pleased to welcome our guest today, In the Flesh. Every Saturday morning, we welcome the warm and thoughtful voice of Scott Simon into our homes, our cars, and our earbuds. We know he has reported from all over the world, won many awards for his journalism, interviewed everyone under the sun from warlords to wallflowers. And now we learn from his new book, Unforgettable, about the wise and remarkable mother who raised him to be a mensch and shared her final days with him. Scott shared those moments on Twitter with more than a million of his followers, and today he brings us the full story. In a recent Washington Post review, journalist Carlos Lozada writes, Simon reveals not the possibilities of social media, but its limits. However intimate those 140 character bursts, they seem inadequate compared with the skilled unspooling of his memoir about growing up alongside his mother in their beloved Chicago and of caring for her in the final breaths. Please welcome back to the Free Library of Philadelphia, Scott Simon. <laughs> is, it, is this an actual Rob Roy? Oh, God bless you. This was my mother's favorite drink. And she, uh, she taught me how to make it when I was very young. I'm going to set it aside right now. It's funny because they have you sitting back there in the green room under the pictures of uh, John Updike and Kurt Vonnegut and Toni Morrison and Neil Doctorow and uh, P.D. James. And I, I suspect they're used to making drinks for some of the authors who've been there. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me and the chance to be here. Uh, I happen to know that there are a lot of other places to go during lunchtime in Philadelphia. So uh, I'm very grateful that you're spending time here. We have uh, at least a couple of uh, friends in the audience I wanted to embarrass. Is Sheila Downing here? Uh, well, perhaps she'll come later. An emergency room nurse that we've gotten to know, an uh, intensive care unit nurse that I follow on Twitter. And this book is dedicated <coughs> to intensive care unit nurses and um, hospital technicians. Um, and uh, I, I know because he came back to see me backstage, Dr. Zeke Emanuel is here, who uh, has some sort of, uh, you've, you're dean at, at Penn, right? No? No, just a, all right, I'm sorry. Well, <laughs> in any event, uh, I, Zeke needs no further introduction. Let me simply refer to him as because of his uh, important work in healthcare reform is at, at once, I think, the least profane and occasionally most controversial of the Emanuel brothers. Um, we, uh, we turned out to go to, to go to the same grammar school uh, in Chicago, and uh, one of his daughters came to work for us uh, at NPR, Gabrielle Emanuel. You will hear her on the air occasionally, although she's getting yet another advanced degree uh, in England. And I, uh, I think the time is coming when Zeke won't be known as one of the Emanuel brothers, but as Gabrielle Emanuel's father, uh, and very, uh, very happily so. <clears throat> Let me, if I can, begin at the almost beginning. <clears throat> Not exactly cheery noontime entertainment, this first paragraph, but it doesn't have to be mordant, let's put it that way. I begin with one of the tweets I sent from the intensive care unit next to my mother. Our children want to know if you're dead forever. I tell them yes, but I wonder about that too. Death makes life worthwhile. It gives each moment meaning. I hope I live to 150 and that our daughters can make it to at least 200. But death drives life. It frightens and inspires us. Do away with death and we'd have no reason to get out of bed or into it, grow, work, or love. Why would we do much of anything if we had the time for everything? It's the certainty of death that moves us to sing and write poems, find friends, and sail across oceans and skies. It's because we know that we don't have all the time in the world that we try to use the uncertain and unknowable time that we have to do something that endures. Death is sad, grim, unwelcome, and invaluable. It's why we try to make something of life. It's why we have children. 
Um, when I went to join my mother in the intensive care unit of, uh, of a hospital in Chicago, I, um, I didn't know that she'd wind up uh, dying there. I knew she was 84 and uh, was being kept in the hospital and was, uh, was sick. Uh, after spending the first night uh, alongside her, I thought it might get her a little bit more attention in the hospital. Um, I decided to go out and get a, I was just on a bunch of blankets, I decided to go out and get one of those camp mats that they actually have an outdoor store on Michigan Avenue in Chicago. And uh, I walked in there and a young man came up to see me and, uh, and I said, look, all I know about the outdoors is that I loathe them. <laughs> and he said, not missing a beat, he said, well, sir, perhaps I can direct you to Bloomingdale's. <laughs> <clears throat> I said, you know, you're really much too funny to be working in an outdoors store. And he said, well, as a matter of fact, I do a little improv on the side. Um, it was though when I, I spent what wound up being the last days of my mother -law, or mother's life uh, alongside her um, in the ICU, the, the talk we had about life and death, it was no longer hypothetical. Uh, it was the next stop ahead for my mother and gosh knows in time for all of us. Um, New York Times asked me to do a piece you might have seen weekend before last on, on, on tweeting and why they, they think perhaps the story, um, my mother's story took digital wings. And I think I came up with <clears throat> what for me are a lot of unsatisfying half answers. One is the, it was after all a universal story of life, death and love. Uh, another is that I think social media platforms have become kind of a papyrus scrolls of our times where we pass on scraps of our lives for people to read or ignore uh, or to forget about them only to be rediscovered later as the, the young man who has been appointed the, the new host of The Daily Show I think is just discovering. Um, strongest reason though I think is my mother. She was just so funny uh, and interesting. Um, students at the Big Nay National High School in Valenzuela City in the Philippines read some of those tweets and they picked some of their favorite lines that my mother had and they wrote papers about what she said. Uh, one of the tweets, my mother in ICU sees Kate and Will holding baby in tears. Every little boy is a little king to his parents. Listening, my mother was struggling for sleep at this point, listening to La Boheme now, Bocelli, Mother can't keep eyes closed. Maybe opera will help. I always slept when I went. <laughs> With all respect for the Lyric Opera of Chicago. Uh, I consider this a good sign. Mother says when the time comes, obit headline should be three Jewish husbands but no guilt. Um, as Andy was kind enough to mention, um, uh, Carlos Lozada's review in the Washington Post, which was the, the first one out. And I'm, I'm not going to be uh, immodest enough to quote it, but I, I, I will be uh, smug enough to paraphrase. Um, because I think a great review uh, can make an author, uh, even the author, especially the author perhaps, to, to see anew what's there. And Carlos Lozado also read into the book that it was in part a remembrance of my mother's friends. Uh, on the north side of Chicago, working women like my mother uh, and men uh, who in the 1960s and 70s were, were often still called confirmed bachelors or simply creative. Um, they worked in clubs and shops and dated some nice guys and an awful lot of cads and or schlemiels. Or perhaps in Philadelphia I can say schmucks. Um, <laughs> In many ways, the hardest part of growing older for my mother, and not just my mother, I'm sure, was losing friends. She said she was, sometimes when the phone jangled, she didn't want to answer it because uh, she knew it would be some nice young voice on the end saying, hi, Pat, I'm Betsy's niece, and I'm sorry to tell you. Um, so let me pick and choose her. I'd like to read a section about some of my mother's friends who uh, grew up as important influences on me. <clears throat> For years, my mother's constant running mate and gal pal was the woman we called Auntie Chris. She'd come to Chicago from a Greek family in Iowa, birth name Chrysula, and indeed possessed the kind of silhouette our teachers and gentlemen used to call classical. Her Aphrodite form helped her find work as a hostess and dancer in clubs along Rush Street when she first hit town, 
which is where she met my mother, and she said, bundles of big-toothed, tousled-haired Kennedy boys sitting with Chicago mobsters. By the way, I happened to read that section in Connecticut the other night, and there were, unbeknownst to me, a few Kennedys in the audience. <laughs> it's a hazard. <clears throat> Chris was hard-headed and droll. She was an outspoken Iowa Republican who was suspicious of what she saw as the local Blarney, Guff, and Moonshine and thought that my mother, whom she loved, could be sweetly naive about men, business, and Democrats. Um, <clears throat> Burn their bras, she'd exclaim, standing tall with Iowa Zoftig. Why would all those gals want to burn their bras? My bra is my best friend. There was Melba, a media buyer for whom my mother worked as a secretary at an ad agency on Michigan Avenue. Melba gleamed. She was silvery, saucy, and the wit in my mother's circle, whom we all waited to hear. One night, someone in the group came back from a drugstore with one of the first dental machines that spurts water through your gums. You filled a small tank, held up a wand, pressed a button, and a hard burst of water, I dare say the right word is spume, spurted from the nozzle. My mother and her friends filled the tank over and over. They giggled as it gushed and dripped, gushed and dripped, they aimed the spurts at each other like kids at a squirt gun fight, tittering, ooh, it likes you, and ooh, it doesn't last very long. The laughter wound down after we'd filled the tank half a dozen times and saw numerous emissions. I think a couple of the women lit cigarettes. <laughs> Melba waited for the quiet to ask, and could you also use that on your teeth? There was Auntie Abba, who was blonde, tall, slim, and walked like a samba, to recall a phrase at the time, as she balanced a Chicago phone book on her head, which she did many times for me and my friends. Auntie Abba may have been the first person I knew who spoke with a British accent. She was about as British as Dolly Parton. <laughs> Abba was from Baton Rouge and worked for her posh enunciation as assiduously as actors from the Royal Shakespeare Company now learn Bayou accents to play Americans. I won't have people up here ask me just about corn liquor and skinning alligators, she said. Auntie Abba trained Playboy bunnies for clubs around the country. She taught the Playboy way to smile, say hello, and deliver drinks with the bunny dip, the maneuver by which they could put a blue Hawaiian in front of a customer without revealing cleavage. Abba disdained. And when Abba disdained, it was a powerful, toxic stream. The criticism that Gloria Steinem had made of Playboy bunny costumes as being painful and demeaning. Uniforms, Abba corrected all, uniforms. And they wear some pretty painful and ridiculous costumes at the Metropolitan Opera, too. Over the years, I think I've quoted Auntie Abba more times than any presidential inaugural address I've ever covered. And I think she and Gloria Steinem would have liked each other. Let me turn ahead. There was Auntie Marion, a former lounge singer who performed up and down Rush Street before she married Charlie Grimm, the old Chicago Cubs first baseman and manager. Marion believed that cigarettes sweetened a voice. She did a lot of sweetening. For years, she carried a fluffy little white pom-pom of a poodle named Sugar in her purse. She wouldn't get home until after the last set and the last drink at 2 or 3 in the morning. This was not a good time to walk a dog who couldn't bite through a jelly donut. So Marion spread the Tribune over the kitchen floor of her studio apartment, a room she otherwise might see only to get fresh ice cubes for scotch, where Sugar could drop her sweet little fudgy sickles. Little Sugar would squat and quiver over the unfurled front page. Auntie Chris would shout, aim for Mayor Daly, aim for Mayor Daly. <laughs> Previous administration, Zeke. So in the hospital, do you remember when we had to spring Chris and Marion from jail? My mother asked from her hospital bed. I lighted my childhood, I told her. The telephone rang one night in the days when it jangled. Auntie Chris said that she and Marion were in prison. Well, they were being booked at the Chicago Avenue police station at any rate and needed help. Auntie Chris told my mother in a tumble they'd gone out for a hamburger on Weld Street, Marion driving. They saw the blue light in the rearview mirror and heard the growl of a siren. A young policeman came to the driver's side to say they'd missed a stop sign. When Marion replied something like, well, I'm so sorry, dear, the policeman sniffed more than a whiff of beer. 
When he asked to see her license, she parted her, patted her pockets, flipped open her purse, and announced, Imagine that. Guess I forgot. The police officer suggested Auntie Chris take over the wheel to drive home. But when he asked to see her license, which she just remembered she'd left in her purse in front of her door, she replied, Well, is that what things are coming to in this town under Dick Daly? You need a license just to run out for a hamburger? I remember the tone of wonder and worry in my mother's voice when she heard this account as she said softly, Oh, Chris. What my mother said now was they were lucky the police didn't drag them to Devil's Island. That night we'd pulled on clothes as if we heard a fire bell. We looked for bail money in the days before automated teller machines. My mother plucked a stack of 20 she'd tucked under tissue paper in her lingerie door drawer. We snagged a cab on North State Parkway and I got to tell the driver, Chicago Avenue Police Station, please, and step on it. <laughs> Imagine how exciting that is for a kid. The station house was blindingly bright inside and crackled and squawked with police radios. A pretty mother with her son in tow drew stairs. Good morning, Captain, my mother told the desk sergeant as if he were the captain of a cruise ship. We'd like to see a couple of your guests. <laughs> The desk sergeant didn't need to consult his blotter. A blue circle of officers surrounded aunties Chris and Marion, who were somewhat to my disappointment, unshackled. Marion roosted on the edge of a desk. Someday he'll come along, <laughs> she sang in a smoky, dusky voice. And he'll be big and strong. Inspired choice for a police station house. There was no arrest, no bail, just the mildest reminder from the police at a stop, to stop at stop signs and carry your license when operating a motor vehicle. A kitten-haired young patrolman told Marion, sure, I'm a cop, but really I want to be a singer. She took his hand and brushed it with her lips. Follow your dream, darling, she told him. <laughs> I sat on my mother's lap in the cab riding back north, Chris and Marion cackling beside us. The second sergeant we saw sure was handsome. Married, for sure. You checked his hand, don't you? The lieutenant was a better dresser. Officers get better uniforms. But believe me, said Auntie Chris, they all wind up wearing those funny little golf shirts and saggy slacks. <laughs> my mother leaned behind my ear to tell me, I don't want you to think that jail is always this much fun. <laughs> what I remember of this group of women from my boyhood is... Lingering impromptu evenings with lots of snorts and laughs. Olives and cheddar cheese on rye crackers. The stroke of matches, the tinkle of ice, compact makeup mirrors folded with a snap. High heels under the coffee table. Crinkled cocktail napkins with lipstick smudges. Earrings pulled out and resting on a coaster. Tony bended on the turntable. An occasional crying jag. And the orange glow of cigarettes, candles, and streetlights just below the windows. I don't remember, or more likely didn't recognize, profound conversations. But I knew the buzz of laughs was goss and gossip was a fizz that refilled my mother and her friends. <clears throat> Most of the women in her circle had been married at least once. A couple would be again. My mother thought one or two might have preferred women, but in those times, finding the right man was believed to be therapy for that. Single working women have children on their own today, my mother didn't think most of her friends would have wanted that. Instead, these tough, funny, and resilient women turned their care and tenderness on the child in front of them. They loved you so much, my mother said now. I loved them. I was blessed. But my mother's friends, and my father for that matter, passed on to me a phrase for the kind of man that they admired, a classy guy. The accolade had nothing to do with money, business, or breeding. Ernie Banks and my school principal, our school principal, Zeke Mort Reisman, were classy guys. And so were Adley Stevenson, Nat King Cole, Sir Noel Coward, and the man who drove the number 36 bus down State Street. The classy guy had manners. He said, please and thank you, Mr. and Miss, and held open doors. Classy guys picked up checks. They left good tips. They dressed with respect. They kept their word. They sent flowers. They apologized personally. They tried to be kind and courteous, even if they sometimes had to be firm, and their best jokes were about themselves. My mother's friends had learned all this by knowing a few classy guys and many who weren't. 
Mistakes, good times, lonely nights, and hard-won laughs had taught them what counted in a man's character. They passed on what they learned to me in dozens of stories. They gave me something to steer toward. My mother's circle of friends gave me a glimpse of good friendship. Friends were the people you called at 3 a.m. to get you out of jail. But they were also the people who were with you at 9 p.m. on a slow Saturday night. Friends shared crisis, and they shared what was often the trickier test of tedium. My mother's humor and strength sometimes made it hard to see how much of her life had been busted, but her friendships with such rugged, chic, and appealing women gave her other lives to care about and gave hers purpose, shape, and a lot of laughter. Um, let me just check, make certain we're all right for time. My mother and I sat up at one point for 48 hours straight in the ICU, and we, we talked about her friends, we talked about her three marriages that gave her what she called that railroad train of a name, Patricia Lyons, Suman, Patricia Lyons, Nyman, Patricia Lyons, Simon, Newman, Gelbin. <laughs> Trip over it even now. Uh, we talked about the way she used to bring me to see great art at the Art Institute. She said um, she had been working on Rush Street, and she said she would walk in on a summer day. It was one of the first places to get universal air conditioning. She said you could walk from room to room or just sit looking green. It was like a vacation. There was Van Gogh. There was Gauguin. I'm sorry, Van Gogh. Um, outside there were buses and trains and police sirens, but inside there was Tahiti. There was a street in Paris. There was a ballet dancer in her dressing room rolling on her socks, or was she taking them off? We talked about her old boyfriends, or at least as many as we could find time for. We talked about her struggle with, uh, with suicide, which uh, I, I noticed is been on the air a lot in the interviews I've done. Her mother had taken her life. As she said, it puts a fly in your head, never quite stops buzzing around. Um, there were times I described in the book when she was tempted, and at least once where she uh, gave in to that temptation. Um, but it's finally a testament to my mother's endurance and her courage that she lived to the age uh, of 84 until the last possible moment. I have a, a section in the book where I talk about how much my mother loved to entertain. Uh, big parties, of course, were just not possible in our one-bedroom um, apartment on the north side, but she'd love to bring five or six people around a small table, and uh, she'd entertain friends to thank them for trudging through snow to see me in a school play, or to console a friend who had just lost her job or her boyfriend, or to congratulate them for losing her job or boyfriend. Uh, she'd gather a group in front of the TV to eat, take out chow mein, or uh, watch a world crisis, uh, or the Wizard of Oz, the World Series, or the Miss America pageant. Um, she brought up card tables from our storage locker to seat a dozen people for Christmas Hanukkah dinners. It was all mixed up in our, in our multi-faith family. And, and she would actually plunk menorahs on the table on, uh, among the little Virgin Mary votive lights that she'd get at Mexican markets. And, and, you know, every now and then someone would say, well, you know, Patty, those are not just candles. Uh, they're religious symbols. And she would say, well, but they're just so pretty, and that's what the season is all about, isn't it? Um, I'm going to read um, one more section about uh, entertaining, actually a couple more. I'll be quick. I don't mean to put you on the spot, Zeke. Do you remember Lar America First Daily? Guy with the Uncle Sam hat? Of course. He ran for every office there was on the ballot, and he campaigned in an Uncle Sam hat, which meant that every couple of years he'd at least get his picture in the Tribune uh, because he campaigned in an Uncle, Uncle Sam hat. I think he also won a couple of equal time provision lawsuits, if I'm not mistaken. So he, you know, he got outsized attention, and because he had the last name Daly, he would probably get uh, more votes than marginal candidates would get. We had an underground uh, magazine at, at Sen High School called Offset, and we sent out very self-important letters to every candidate on the ballot, inviting them to meet with our editorial board uh, for our endorsement. <laughs> and, I mean, not even the vegetarians or prohibitionists wrote back, but God bless him, Lar America First Daily did. And he came over to our one-bedroom apartment once for uh, an editorial board interview. <clears throat> 
Lar Daly wore an old gray suit with elephant ear lapels for our meeting, but doffed his towering Uncle Sam hat to my mother when he opened the door. Sure is nice to enter hostile territory, he said, and see a pretty face. I forget what urgent questions we asked Lar Daly. He said a few crackpot things I can't recall, and several that made our editorial board of sardonic youngsters roll our eyes. Public schools are a mess, and the U.S. government snoops on everybody. Things that make me wonder today why we sneered. Lar Daly brightened when my mother asked about his Uncle Sam hat. You just don't buy that in a costume shop, do you, she asked. I can tell from here the stitching is exquisite. <laughs> Good eye, ma'am. Got a Lithuanian woman works for me, sews it all by hand. I go through two or three of these a year. You see, I keep stuff here. He shook out papers at the bottom of his hat, kind of like my office, so I can keep both hands free to meet people. Lincoln kept his office in his hat, too, when he was a young Buck Prairie lawyer. People laughed at him in those days, too, trying to be a lawyer, no education. That squeaky voice, those long legs growing out of his suits. Our editorial board had been in session for more than an hour, and Lar Daly, who did not otherwise invite further comparison to Lincoln, um, picked up his hat and began his goodbyes. I know you must have a campaign appearance to make, my mother told him but please don't run off until we've at least given you a drink for your trouble. He did have one, scotch, rocks as I recall, and then one more for the road. My mother brought out peanuts and some kind of cheese with little toasts. You know, I run a bar stool company, he told us. Business is okay, but the glory days is back when I was young in the 30s. Bookies needed stools. You know why, Mrs. Simon? My mother leaned forward. No, I was a child. They couldn't sit at desks and post the numbers on a blackboard, so they sat on stools. The cops knew where all the betting parlors were because they'd bust them. And I'd tell the cops, give me an address, I'll give you 50 cents for each stool that we sell. The cops would raid them every few weeks, remove the furniture, and the books would just reopen and buy more stools. It kept the business flowing, I tell you. The second scotch in the reminisce seemed to make Lar Daly's eyes a little watery. But I guess the glory days are always when we're young. Right, Mrs. Simon? You are so right, Mr. Daly, she told him. I got six kids, he said between sips, all grown now. I know people Jake jokes about me, and I always worry about them getting hurt. Hey, your dad's that crazy guy in the Uncle Sam suit. Kids can be jerks. But I tell them, and Mrs. Simon, I'm going to tell your boy right here, you can't let a little razzing get you down. You got to do what you believe in. Hey, they all laughed at Christopher Columbus, didn't they? And he sure brought home the gold. You were the soul of graciousness that day, I told my mother, with the man most people would have laughed down the stairs. He was a guest in our home, she said. I'm not sure I'd want him to be president or even dog catcher. But he sure dedicated his life, didn't he? Well, you saw that, I told her. I was trying to be sophisticated and cynical, like a journalist in the movies, and just saw the crackpot. You were gracious and found the human being. I'm going to end with a section that I'm eager to read because I can't read it in front of my children. And I've been on tour with them. But it has to do with entertaining. And apologies in advance. I, another character is going to enter the narrative here named Hai, who was one of my mother's old boyfriends, who was a former boxer who was a brassiere salesman. kind of fit a pattern. <laughs> the entertaining you did, I told her, I figured out a few years ago why. Why not? It was fun. It was just you and me. Dad wasn't around or dependable, but you enlarged our circle. You gave a kind of home to all the aunties and the uncles. They taught me stuff and enriched our lives. You gave them something too, baby, my mother told me. It's, it's hard to be alone like they were. Maybe some of that's changing. Do you remember High's little joke, I asked her? He had so many. This one was really raw. Oh, that. Hi, the boxer who became the bra man was a guest one night when my mother had six or eight people at the table and on the couch and talked to her into a story in the paper about an assistant coach on the Chicago Bears who had such an unruly appetite, he'd run out of the team's training camp in rural Indiana and ate raw ears of corn. Raw, said Auntie Chris with contempt. Utterly raw. Can you imagine? And he's not some poor migrant worker, but a fat, well-fed coach. How can he discipline young men? Raw, she repeated. Utterly raw. 
After a lot of yucks and oohs around the table, High piped up. Ugh, all that corn silk, he said. He probably just thought he was eating a blonde. <laughs> yes, you got it, ma'am. <laughs> Give me a minute. I'm going to bring this back to Wistful now. <laughs> the living room roared and rocked with laughter. I felt my face flush as people looked around to see if I understood what High had said. I was about 12. I didn't. But to try to look wise, I joined the laughing until all my aunties and uncles began to lean across the table to kiss my forehead and rustle my hair. I realized in the wash of loving laughter that followed a foul, funny joke I didn't understand that my mother had made a pretty sweet place for me in the world. Um, I'm going to stop there. We want to invite your questions, and I certainly want to leave time uh, for anyone who wants to get a book, which I hope will be more or less everybody here. Uh, the publisher has very thoughtfully come out with this in time for Mother's Day. I say, why wait? Nothing to me says April 15th, time to file your taxes, like a, a copy of Unforgettable. Um, as I think we've already demonstrated, there's life, death, sex, adultery, love, number of good naughty jokes in here. Um, I also hope that at some point it, it, it peels back the heart of love. Um, my mother had a real life. I don't mind telling you it's an unexpected, unimagined pleasure to see her, to see her face uh, on a book because she was uh, not a Bush or a Kennedy or a Windsor or not a Kardashian. Uh, she wasn't a Hollywood star or a public intellectual or a corporate tycoon or politician, but she was, as, as our friend Scott Turow says, and I quote Scott, gorgeous and charming and a true star to the very end. Uh, I also want to say that as I wound up running it through my mind, I think the great gift that she had, and she had, she had a wonderful memory for, for jokes and old movies and family stories, but she also had a kind of genius for forgetting. Um, I think we recognize this in children when they are exercised one moment and forget about it the next. My mother forgot old slights and insults and outrages, and she left behind a, a lot of hurts and tragedies uh, and mistakes. Um, as I had it up, added up for this book, she was the only child of parents who often couldn't be bothered with her. Um, she loved and married a talented and sweet man, my father, who, who drank himself uh, into a nosedive. Uh, she lost a daughter. She had a mother who took her life when she needed her most. Um, she had to take her son, that's me, and jump out of a marriage before um, her husband made all of us crash. Her heart must have been shaken up and broken a thousand times. And I know she often felt lonely and abandoned, and, and I know she looked over the edge. I think a lot of people would have used any one of those events to paralyze their lives, to immobilize themselves, to say, well, there's no getting over this, there's no getting on. She didn't do that. She kept moving. She lived through a lot, and she left a lot behind. I admire that. Um, Please, let me invite your questions now. Uh, I'm, I've been told, uh, yes, and we have. See you later, doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Zeke. Please, yeah. Dr. Emanuel comes to all of my appearances. It's very nice. Scott, I got a copy can of I, your can I, tell, can I tell a brief story? Yeah, before you. So, working on the book in France, this place called Deauville, there was a seagull who perched himself in front of our apartment. And he was kind of small and cocky. I, I told this to Zeke. Small and cocky. To me, see, we began to call him the mayor of Deauville. So, naturally, that got shortened to Rom. And every morning, we'd see him on the street. And we thought the seagull was going, hey. That's a great effing baguette you got there, buddy. <laughs> little baguette action over here, little baguette action over here. Sorry, I wrote most of the book. Please, sir. <laughs> yeah. 
I got a copy of your book uh, the day it came out and finished it, and two sentences stuck out to me, and I wanted – your mother had said that I want to know how much they affected your life. From page 166, never be afraid to go into a classy place, baby. Remember, you belong. Yeah. On the next page, it says, show children the best people and places. Let them know they belong. Did that really affect you? Yes. It uh – you know, and, I, I, and I, I didn't hear that put into words by my mother until just a few years ago. This was, uh, I'll explain, the night before her first cancer surgery. Um, and it was a rough dinner. She had had trouble keeping stuff down. And when she'd been a, a working girl on, on Rush Street, she knew a, a path of a hotel and other public building lobbies you could go through to keep out of Chicago's cold uh, in the winter. And we went into this uh, splendid or I didn't go in there, but she took our daughter and my wife into the, we just had the one daughter then, into this splendid bathroom in the Drake Hotel, which is where not just the Sullivans, but a lot of Irish families had worked, and, and particularly my grandmother was the um, maitre d'es at the uh, Cape Cod room there. And I wondered why when my wife came out with Elise, our, our oldest daughter, who's now going to be turned 12 this month, uh, why my wife's eyes were shimmering. My mother just didn't obviously know how her cancer, how the surgery would go, and she had apparently said to her in the bathroom, honey, never be, <laughs> sorry, never be afraid to go into a classy place. Remember, you deserve it. To this little girl adopted from an orphanage in China. Uh, and yes, that's what she tried to do for me, and I, I, I think my wife and I have, uh, have certainly tried to do that for, uh, for our children. Sorry. I'm surprised it took me that long, actually, in these appearances. Uh, any questions over there? Ms. Smith, yeah. Hi. Um, two things I just want to say. My father died on February 22nd, and I Sorry. was just astounded last year to read what you had to say as your mother was passing and then as the publicity around your book has come out it has just been an amazing healing to my open sore in my heart i want to thank, thank you. you i'm just curious at what point in your life were you able to sort of start backing away and seeing the big picture of what an astounding woman your mother was having overcome all the things that you just described. I mean, you know, when you're a child, it's just what it is because yeah. it's your life. But now as you you get into an adult adulthood where you see what yeah. exactly it was, I, I'm just curious when you got to where you could sort of back mm -hmm. away and see that in such an amazing way. I, I, I like to think that it, at, at some level I always recognized it even if I couldn't bring myself to articulate it, which is, I think, what happens when you're uh, when you're an adolescent. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been blessed to have the kind of work that I do and to get around the world and, I, and to meet a lot of people. And I think I began to break it. I, I, I would fix that in maybe my mid to late twenties, uh, and that just built and grew over over the years. And, and I, I think even more dramatically like over the past 10 or 15 years uh, when I've been married and, and, and with our children and to recognize that. But you're right, close up, it's a very hard, it's a very hard thing to recognize. I heard it all of my life from people, um, other people who would recognize it. Uh, Scott Turow was, was kind enough to write a blurb for the book, but he was a particular, particular fan of, uh, of my mother's. There's a Chicago Public Library we speak in the Philadelphia Library has an annual event where uh, I, I do not have a driver's license. So she would get a ride home with Scott Turow. <laughs> and, and at the annual event of Chicago Public Library dinner in recent years, I've, I've, I've interviewed authors. That's kind of the so-called entertainment of the night. And my mother, totally indifferent to that. But she would talk to me the next morning about, and Scott said this, and Scott said that. <laughs> Tell you the truth, I had a hard time with that. Uh, yes, ma'am. Hi, Scott. I'm Mary Heron. 
and I'm part of the Nick Virgilio Haiku Association. Oh, yes. And I'd like to give you this latest book that was published uh, about a year and a half ago that is Nick's work that was unpublished previously. And um, we're really glad that you're here and we appreciate your friendship through the years. So if I can, I'd like to. Thank you. Thank you. Here's another one. Nick Virgilio was uh, the great haiku poet of the United States who was on our, our show. Uh, regrettably been gone a number of years, but thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, yes. The Affordable Care Act, uh, notwithstanding its critics, attempts to deal with uh, end of life days. Uh, has this experience uh, given you a different view of uh, end of life and how treatment should be uh, uh, provided to those in, uh, in an end of life situation? No, uh, I, I can't say that it has. I mean, um, Diane Rehm, uh, is, is her show on in, in here? No, okay. But Diane has been very outspoken about this, and I, there's nothing, you know, my, I, I can't say those issues were raised uh, in my mother's case, so I don't think it's given me uh, a different understanding. It, it, it's interesting because, of course, we were, just joined by my old boyhood friend, who's often referred to as uh, and, and the uh, architect of the Affordable Care Act, which I'm not sure is true, but it's interesting for all the talk about death panels and everything. Dr. Emanuel has been outspoken in his suspicion of uh, of his opposition to euthanasia laws, uh, laws permitting euthanasia and that sort of thing. He just believes it's a it's a slippery slope, um, and. Um, I, I don't know as the I don't know as the kind of care that that my mother got in the hospital would have extended her life by even an hour, but uh, I'm, I'm glad she was able to live up until the last minute of the uh, re really coherent and was able to speak with us until until the last few hours. I'm very grateful for that. And uh, uh, there was at, at no point was she was she ready to give up exactly. I think when she began, give up is such a terrible phrase. Um, I think at one point she began to see what was ahead and became reconciled to it. But we treasured those those hours and days that we had to be able to speak with each other. I'm very, very grateful for that. And they were worth all the care that they took. You Thank really you. expect me to call on you when you're wearing that shirt. It's a Philly shirt. Okay. We'll get there. The game doesn't start until 3, so we still have Oh, time. a 3 o'clock start. Okay, yeah. The title, Unforgettable. A bit of Nat Cole or something? Else. Yes. My mother and I were singing, um, singing songs with each other in the hospital room, and uh, I, I quickly downloaded some music on my iPad, and uh, including the best of Nat King Cole and Unforgettable just seemed to come up time after time. So and now I... I mean, I, I, I hear it all the time. Uh, airport restrooms, I hear it. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Fire yes, yeah, that, I'm, I'm sure that's it. Yeah, that's the, uh, um, yes, the gentleman in the Philly shirt. <laughs> Who's on the mound? Cole Hamels. Of Cole Hamels, of course. Best pitcher in baseball. Do you notice, you notice with their fancy new pitching staff, the Cubs, First strike over the plate last night, and yet it, they fell three runs behind by, what was it, the second inning? Sorry. Perhaps you didn't notice that. I did. Yeah. Um, I feel for you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great suit, by the way. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Seriously. Um, I, have, I really enjoy your uh, weekly essays, and I think you. you have a wonderful writing voice, um, clearly in evidence today. Did you have an editor or a mentor or someone who said, this is your voice? And was there a moment where you found that voice? And did someone point it out to you? And second question since it's yeah. opening day, how bad did they ruin Wrigley Field? Well, I want to see it in person before I have any, Wrigley Field question first. I want to see it in person before I have any, um, 
uh, before I deliver any, any bromides, uh, broadsides. I, I got to throw out the first pitch last summer. Uh, I could show you pictures. <laughs> Low and outside. And it, forgive me, one of our, my favorite little stories about our, our older daughter. Um, they bring you up to be interviewed by the club announcers in the seventh inning, as I recall. And one of the club announcers took me aside, and he was laughing, and he said, I have to tell you what your daughter said. So what's that? She said, you know, my dad could have been a baseball pitcher, because, like, he's really good, but he really wanted to work for NPR. <laughs> God, I love her. Um, no, I, I didn't have, I mean, I, I, I read a lot, and I think like a lot of people who want to be writers, you go through periods. I wanted to be Hemingway, I wanted to be Mailer, I wanted to be James Agee. Um, the best, just about the best advice I think I got about writing is actually in this book from my Auntie Marion, who, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, Auntie Melba, who worked in advertising after all. And I was, she, we'd go to, my mother worked for Auntie Melba as a secretary at the ad agency, uh, Darcy, it was called Darcy Advertising. And we were yeah, at night, and just because I could run off copies there, photocopy the 25 pages of whatever, or 25 uh, copies of the newspaper. And she was reading something and she said, Scotty, do you want people to know that you've done your homework or to actually read this? And I think that's very good advice. Uh, I mean, I got a letter recently from a young man asking me to write a recommendation, and he actually said, do you think what I want to do is a fecund area for study? <laughs> I was tempted to tell him the same thing. I hope he'll read it first, though, so I don't have to. Um, are, are there other questions? I think we have time. Yes. Hi, Scott. Sheila. Sheila. Hi. I, I tried to introduce you at first. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I got here a little late, only two no, hours No, no, no. You've asleep. been up. Yeah, two this hours This is our friend Sheila like, Downing, Hi. who is a, a nurse here at Hanman Hospital? No, Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Whatever. Neuro ICU. I beg your pardon. <laughs> and so you Hi. saw the the um, the uh, dedication in the book is to yes, ICU yes. work. Yes, right? thank you so much. Uh, just quickly, I just wanted to, as a nurse in the uh, Neuro ICU, I was just wondering, uh, during your journey with your mother, whether there's any advice that you could share for nurses, doctors, medical personnel to make your journey a little easier or someone else's during this particular time? Um, you know, some of it is, is stunningly practical, and we went over this with the, um, with the people at the hospital because uh, obviously my mother uh, got a lot of publicity. And... Um, I also pointedly don't mention the name of the hospital in Chicago, although it's not, not hard to figure out. Um, some of the stunningly practical things, uh, they, the recliners in the intensive care unit don't recline. They had apparently been lawyered out. <laughs> Little things like that. Um, they ought to have a movie channel for people who well, movies that would be fun and inspiring and provoke laughter. Uh, not not the ones that are there now. I've got some sections in the book where my mother and Mr. Washington, one of the respiratory technicians, are talking about seeing something on late at night because because you're up all hours. Where it was it was a, it was apparently some kind of Viking sex epic, um, <laughs> which my mother said just not in the mood for when she was. You know, and, and she also said it's also hard to see, like, the all news channels because, as my mother was quite blunt about saying, it's a little hard to look at news about the world that you, you yeah, right, you're not going to be around. So that's some of the, you know, the, the respiratory technicians, the hospital technicians, the nurses were exquisite. Uh, in the level of care that they gave my mother. And as I think I say in the, in the acknowledgments, this was this is routine for them. I don't know how many people they have they have seen into death since my mother died a year and change ago. So um, I just that's why I dedicated the book to them. I have a world of admiration. Um, 
I, I think the attention from the doctors that were there was not of the same high order. Um, my mother went into the hospital in July. I have been told subsequently, oh, you never go into the hospital in July, because that's, I guess, when the new residents come on. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'll remember that in the future in case I have a terminal illness, but, <laughs> oh, pumpkin, not July. Can we, can we make it in like February where they know what they're doing? Um, there just seemed to be a remoteness. The, the pulmonologist who signed my mother in never came to see her. Uh, her personal physician um, never came to see her. Uh, she, it, it was amorphous, as Dr. Emanuel, who was here, said nobody owned the case. And what my mother not only needed but deserved was for someone to sit down with her and say, uh, Mrs. Patricia Lyon, Simon Newman Gelbin, uh, I'm sorry, we just don't have any answers. Nobody, nobody, uh, nobody did that. And as I said, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure. At one point, the pulmonologist called me because I had, and I would leave. Have you read the book, Sheila? It'll, I, I describe some of the messages I would leave, where I would say, you know, when our cat was spayed, we got calls from the vet twice a day, and we never get calls from the. Um, there was just a, you know, there was just a, um, a, a lack of it. And, you know, and I know that the senior physicians were all out there huddled over laptops in the hallways. Uh, so were they aware of what was going on with my mother? Yes, but what it needed was for someone to cross that surprisingly large threshold and hold her hand and, and talk to her like a real human being. Beg your pardon. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. One more question. I think that's you now. Yeah. Three years ago, my mother was in uh, intensive care at Mass General Hospital for two weeks, cardiac intensive care, and then two weeks in um, step down unit, five weeks in a rehab hospital. What was incredible was that in the intensive care, they put a cot in for me, and I slept there every night for two weeks. And when she was in a coma, every day I told her what was going on, what was happening. Um, the nurses were unbelievable yeah. to me, unbelievable that they allowed that. They also gave me a, um, a big poster to put up that could tell about who my mother was because at 87, usually people are written off. Yeah. And this is my mother. She's 91. Oh, way to go. <laughs> oh. oh, that's wonderful. This is wonderful. And, and today is her birthday, so thank you for Today is this. your birthday. I'm sorry, ma'am. What is your name? I'm delighted to be here, and I'm listening to you, and I can hear my daughter because her talking to me and being with me constantly brought me back, and I've had a new life, and I'm grateful. I... What is your mother's name? Betty. Betty. May we? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Betty. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> um, I go out somewhere now. Sip my Rob Roy, and I hope, I hope sign books. Thank you very much for joining us.